I want to start off by thanking my dissertation committee, uh, my chair, Dr. Jackie Stavros, Dr. McCord, Dr. Raghavan. Uh, without their guidance and help, I probably wouldn't be here until the second or third research day. So uh, very, very, very happy to be here. So um, as the uh, title suggests, I looked at enterprise risk management and it's tied to firm financial performance. And really, to give you the background, so enterprise risk management is a relatively new paradigm in risk management. Been around for, let's say, a decade, 10 to 15 years, but really being widely adopted within the last, let's say, seven to uh, eight years. And really, it's driven by organizations looking for a better way to manage risk, right? We have the global financial crisis, we had multiple uh, uh, major uh, corporate meltdowns, um, and risk management has become a very top of mind topic for executives. So uh, ERM is a relatively new paradigm and there's relatively little research on ERM out there. Okay, just to give you sort of a quick overview of why ERM is different, traditional, traditional risk management was more about really financial risk management, more about insurance, hedging, uh, currency swaps, those type of things. Risks were typically managed in silos, it was mostly local risk managers, it was more about financial and ha financial risks, uh, physical and financial risks. Very tactical, very ad hoc. And enterprise risk management has come along and said, we need to look at risk holistically. Like, s similar to modern portfolio theory where we look at how all risks correlate, we need to look at risk management from an enterprise-wide perspective. We need to have a chief risk officer or a CFO who's in charge of executive level coordination. And we need to look at how our risks are integrated across the enterprise. Maybe a risk in one geography has a natural hedge, like we have two separate risks, but they have their natural hedges across different geographies. If I'm short on one currency in North America and long in another currency in Europe, those are potentially natural hedges, whereas if you're looking at those individually, you may end up hedging uh, you know, each individual geography and therefore uh, creating uh, corporate waste. ERM is more strategic, it's continuous embedded. Everybody in the organization, according to ERM, is a risk manager. It's part of your job to identify risks and help the company manage those risks. So ERM is a, you know, a, a, a corporate-wide type of initiative. So very different than sort of the traditional, I have an, I'm an insurance manager and that's how I, I manage the risk through purchasing insurance. So, um, Sorry. So really, uh, here are the main research questions, and let me just give a little bit more of a backdrop. Prior research in ERM was pretty much, uh, has, has been fairly concentrated on uh, treating ERM as a binary variable. Either you have ERM or you don't. It really failed to look at ERM as a maturity process, like we look at quality or, or other, perform or other uh, uh, strategic initiatives. So we looked at the association between ERM and firm financial performance using a mixed methods approach, uh, looking at both qualitative and quantitative data, and looked at not only adoption, but looked at maturity, okay? So asking firms how mature are specific ERM processes and tying those to firm financial performance. So research questions. One, is the adoption of ERM processes associated with firm financial performance? Two, is ERM maturity associated with firm financial performance? And three, do we have specific characteristics that moderated the association? Okay, so our unit of analysis, we looked at U.S. publicly traded organizations. Okay, we limited to U.S. publicly traded organizations for multiple reasons. One, uh, we're pulling financial data from 10Ks. So U.S. organizations use U.S. GAAP. So if I add international organizations in, there's potentially different, uh, you're not comparing apples to oranges due to different accounting standards. And also, U.S. publicly traded organizations are very likely to have adopted or more likely to have adopted ERM processes due to being large and complex and trying to manage multiple financial risks. So here's an overview of the sample selection. Um, we had a total of 134 organizations in our, uh, in our sample. And our first research question looked at, is adoption associated with firm financial performance? And so we looked at multiple financial metrics on the left here. You can see we looked at capital efficiency, profitability, we looked at total share of return, we looked at volatility, we looked at Tobin's quotient, which is a, a proxy for firm value, we looked at PE ratio. So we really looked at a lot of capital efficiency, market perception, valuation, profitability. We kind of looked at a very robust set of financial metrics. 
to really ask, our companies that adopt ERM, are they, are they outperforming their peers? And we controlled for, we controlled for industry as well, no, noting that the organizations that answered the survey were from different industries. So we controlled for that. And we looked at it through multiple time horizons, one, three, and five years. And you'll see that really the, here's my, my p-values, and really uh, just the gray showing the significance that for the most part we found in terms of ERM adoption, uh, we, we did not find uh, very much uh, evidence that there was any correlation between or association between ERM adoption and financial performance. Actually, the only significant value we had was five-year ROE, where the coefficient was negative, which would be actually the opposite of what we expect. Organizations that are adopting ERM were performing, were performing worse. And here's a scatter plot just showing sort of a, a graphical representation of the type of result we got from the first hypothesis. Obviously, not adoption on the left, adoption on the right, and we can see that there's just fairly little differentiation between uh, the two categories. More dots, looking at uh, okay, uh, not adoption, adoption, so ROIC. So here's my, my, uh, my population of adopters and my non-adopters. And you can see there's fairly little uh, variation between uh, those populations or samples. So second hypothesis was, is ER maturity associated with firm financial performance? So once again, we looked at the same metrics and we had uh, still uh, fairly limited evidence or, or, or very little evidence that ERM was affecting uh, anything related to firm financial performance, but we did have evidence that it was, uh, it was uh, associated with uh, daily return volatility, right? Which really, if you think about volatility is our financial measure of risk, Okay, and this was measured as daily stock price volatility over the one, three, and five year period. And the coefficients were negative, which was within our expectations. So you would expect that if risk management is doing anything, it should at a minimum help uh, minimize risk, right? And so that's what, we've, that's what we see here. We see that uh, there's an association between uh, volatility, a negative association, inverse relationship between having mature ERM processes and, uh, and daily return volatility. Okay, and here's a scatter plot showing uh, one-year stock volatility versus total ERM maturity. Okay, ERM maturity was graded on a scale of one to five using our capability and maturities model uh, developed at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and you can see a significant inverse relationship that as uh, it's sort of a, a consolidation of the variance as maturity increases, uh, organizations, there was an association of, of or the relationship of less uh, variability. More dots, lots of dots, but basically these are showing uh, the non-risk uh, metrics. So our financial metrics, we're saying once again, fairly li little uh, evidence of an association uh, for our uh, capital efficiency, our profit margin, total shareholder return, or uh, firm valuation. Okay, the final hypothesis we looked at was do, are there certain moderating variables? Are there certain variables that moderate or affect the impact of ERM? And we looked at the following four variables. We looked at size, leverage, slack, and opacity. Our assumption was that larger companies would gain uh, more benefit from ERM. Uh, companies that had more leverage, as measured by debt to equity or debt to asset ratio, would uh, have more benefit from ERM. Slack is a measure of, two minutes? Slack is a measure of uh, liquidity. And we assume that those organizations that had more liquidity would uh, can somewhat self-insure, so they would have less benefit from ERM. And opacity is a measure of companies with significant intangible assets, and um, those are often undervalued in times of crisis, so we expect they would, uh, uh, that they would gain value from ERM. So on the bottom is the results. But we did find that eight of the nine capital efficiency metrics, size was an effective moderator. We found that leverage uh, typically was not a moderator from a statistically significant perspective. Slack, uh, for five of the nine capital efficiency metrics, did moderate the, the association, and opacity did not. So real quickly, we also conducted a thematic analysis. I've shown you the quantitative results. Qualitatively, I've distilled down to the top two questions we asked organizations that did not adopt ERM 
Why did you not adopt ERM? And lack of financial benefits was the primary answer uh, when, we, when we conducted the thematic analysis. And similarly, we asked organizations that did adopt ERM, describe the impact that you've observed. And once again, minimum financial impact or unknown impact was the primary finding. So once again, the quantitative results is saying that ERM and ERM maturity is not really impacting financial or not associated with financial results, except for volatility or risk. And the qualitative analysis is really substantiating that finding as well. So the main key findings, and then I'll wrap it up because I'm getting the, uh, the, the one minute warning here. Uh, little evidence that ERM adoption and maturity is associated with firm financial performance. Okay. Uh, there was an inverse relationship between ERM maturity and, vol and volatility, which is what we'd hoped that ERM would do at a minimum, is reduce volatility and manage risk. And the qualitative analysis supported strongly the quantitative results for both adopters and not adopters, citing lack of financial benefits as the key reason for not adopting, or finding those that did adopt found that there wasn't uh, significant evidence of, um, at, least an, at least from the survey, of uh, financial uh, improvement. Let's see here. Whoop. Let's fill off the stage here. Uh, real quick, um, we concluded the study with saying, despite all this, these findings, ERM is here to stay. Uh, there's significant regulation that is uh, promoting ERM. Investors are demanding organizations adopt ERM, and so is uh, regulators. So uh, in this study, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about it at the end of the session since I'm out of time, but we've also provided some uh, ways in which organizations can make ERM most effective and provided suggestions there. So thank you for listening. My name is Riwa Dishman. I want to begin today's presentation by thanking my professors. Today's research it really reflection of the inspiration that I got from Dr. Castelli in her global research, uh, global leadership class, and the uh, uh, really good wisdom advice that I got from Dr. Hoffner in his uh, quality research class. So why this uh, research is important? Several reasons. Number one, it's my life. I've been teaching online since 2006, and uh, I teach uh, full time now for a medical university, A.T. Steele University. Our school of health management is 100% online. So even though school is in Missouri and Arizona, I still live in Michigan. Um, so over the years, I have dreamed up a perfect student in my mind. If student can lead themselves, and it will be make my life much easier. This is the uh, number one reason. And uh, the other reason that you're gonna see is what's going on in the online learning world. Here it is. Based on Ambria Insights research in 2011, you look at a trend, by 2015, 25 million learners are going to learn online. And look at the growth. In 2010, it's about 14. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I got the number mixed. Um, 2010 was 4 million, and 2015, you see 14 million. So it's an increase of 10 million learners online. And uh, look at the, uh, the students who um, take some online classes. In 2010, about 12 million, and in 2015, and another 10 million uh, increase. And those students going to uh, take classes exclusive online is the greatest growth area. Uh, in 2010, it's only about 1 million, and in 2015, it's near 4 million. So you look at more than triple increase. And, and this is a very recent study by uh, Sloan Consortium. Sloan Consortium is a very so authoritative in studying the uh, online education in the United States. The, the, the 2012 research indicate is online learning strategic to universities. They studied over 2,800 academic officers in the United States universities and institutions, and they found uh, in 2002, uh, less than 50% of the, uh, the, the chief academic officers said it's that's strategic to them. But in the recent study, it shows 70% is important. And so next question is, uh, what percent of students are learning online? And you look at the 2002, it's 9.6, it's about 10%, and 10 years later, 32%, which again, that tripled. So the most important thing is, uh, is online learning good? Is it valid? Um, so look at the comparison to face-to-face. Uh, -to -face. 
In 2003, it's about 57% academic officers to think the, uh, their students' uh, learning is effective as compared to face-to-face. -face. Five years later, 20% increase to 77%. So <clears throat> now you see there is a lot of good reasons for me to study on this, and there's a sustainability in this, uh, in this research. So as I mentioned earlier, I have dreamed up a perfect student in my mind, students who can lead themselves. But now let's take a look at what is an existing research. Existing research, first of all, very limited in online in general, in peer-reviewed world. I, and I think perhaps the, the stigma still exists uh, when the peer reviewers uh, review the article about online learning. So that's, you know, in my DBA studies, and I learned that could be a reason. The other reason is, as you can see the study, in the last 10 years is really the tremendous growth in online learning. So right now, the current research basically gives you this construct that focuses on uh, the um, what is the uh, access to online learning, the effect on students, okay? Uh, their attitude towards online learning and their ability to learn online environments and the ability to collaborate with others, uh, meaning just other students and the faculty. Uh, so basically that's kind of the, uh, the, the scope that you're looking at. What is lacking is uh, the, the connection between the students' ability to lead themselves and their outcome in their learning online, both the individual courses and in the entire program. So that's where what I'm leading to. But next thing is, let's take a look at leadership study. Leadership study, as you can see, there's a lot focusing on leadership, but not a lot on followership. Exemplary followers and exemplary followership. And so this study trying to connect the relationship of those students in an online learning environment who can lead themselves and then their learning outcome. So this is just very quickly the, uh, the exemplary followers. So who are really exemplary followers? Well, in fact, they are actually, they are, they are self-leaders. They can lead themselves, they can work with others, and they can help their leaders to solve problems and achieve goals. And this is just more on um, exemplary followership. And uh, e, uh, Robert E. Kelly is really uh, you know, considered as the, uh, the father of the followership. But this is a, a still a study that can be, uh, an area can be studied a lot. So this is the, uh, the study that I, uh, I proposed. Um, I am going to use a qualitative inquiry and uh, phenomenological study and study 30 university instructors, both for either full-time or part-time, and really to interview their perspective. Um, the focus is an exemplary online adult learner um, in their ability to achieve a learning outcome. And then so we're going to study the relationship between these students' ability to lead themselves and the learning outcome. I'm going to have four research questions, four main research questions. So some of them have um, uh, sub-questions. So all together, you have nine questions. And the unit of analysis is the, uh, the uh, university instructor, and either in undergraduate or graduate degree program. And I made very specific. They're going to be teaching a degree program at a university, and those universities are headquartered in the United States. The sampling procedure. Um, I wanted to use a purposeful sampling and to select the, uh, the 30 university uh, instructors. And uh, here is the, uh, the support for uh, my rationale and from a pattern. Um, sample size is 30, and so very specific, and I teach online and uh, in six different universities, and some, the online can be total online and a hybrid, hybrid sometimes also called a blended. Uh, data collection is a two-phase. Phase one is a pilot testing. Pilot testing is uh, already, uh, already done. Um, I interviewed two university uh, professors, and, uh, and that actually helped me uh, 
uh, refine the research questions. The question that I just showed you briefly is a reflection of the, uh, uh, the, the pilot testing. The second phase is the interview, and this I yet to uh, complete. Um, I have IRB already done, and it's going to be a 50 minute interview. And I'm going to have open-ended questions, very in-depth, and just see what the conversation takes because this is very exploratory. And I got two minutes warning. Uh, interviews with each uh, participant is going to face-to-face, and uh, um, via, either via Skype or uh, uh, via actually a physical face-to-face. Uh, it's going to be tape recorded, and uh, it's a very in-depth interview. What is the significance of the study? It's exploratory, and we hope that the findings of study can help universities de design the program a little bit differently, perhaps, and improve them. Um, the limitations is because the study based on the personal perceptions of the university instructors, obviously the, uh, the personal bias is going to be reflected in the result. Um, Target audience, two groups, the online adult learners and the educators and administrators. What is the outcome conceptually? Conceptually, we really hope that have better understanding of online learner and how the, uh, their ability to learn will affect the outcome of the, uh, the individual course design and individual um, and the degree design. Um, we hope to use the results to help to, to provide some evidence, empirical evidence to universities, those administrators who are in place to uh, redesign and refine the program. And so lastly, I'm just going to share a little bit real quickly with you. In fact, we, we discussed this uh, where I teach full time. And as a result of some of these discussions, we already refined our 100% online program before students did not have to uh, go to any physical place at all. But we found the students need that connection, especially at the beginning. They need a connection with their colleagues and the professors. And so we now have a learning institute. So the students need to do that four times a year and three days each time. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. So, and I would like to start. Uh, my topic today is Antecedents of Global Mindset, a comparison among German, US, and dual citizen leaders. And first of all, I want to thank you, Tom, Dr. Marx, my dissertation chair, because he was responding so quickly, I couldn't have done it so fast. I was the fastest in my cohort, and Tom, that's because of you. Thank you. And next, I want to thank you, Matt, Dr. Cole, um, because he walked me through the stats part. And I think we have a pretty sophisticated stats part. I will let you know later, so thank you very much for that. And of course, Jackie, Dr. Stavros, thank you so much, because what she did, she encouraged me to publish. So in the first year of the dissertation, um, of the program when we had already our, only our classes. So she encouraged me to publish a paper and I was able to present it at the Midwest Academy of Management. And it was in the first year. Thank you so much. And what happened, because I was thinking research, that's nothing for me. When my husband did his dissertation almost 20 years ago, that research, okay, he's an engineer, but that's a little bit different, but that's boring. But thank you. <laughs> it is not, not at all. So I had a really great, great committee. My topic is about globalization. Globalization is everywhere. We can see it everywhere. We have foreign cars, what we do. And that is a problem because what we can see with Daimler Chrysler happened. The next thing what happened to, for example, for Walmart in Germany, they lost three billion dollars. And I think three billion, I think, I know, it's a big company. But nevertheless, three billion is a lot. And they went out, they never went back to, to Europe except for the UK so far. What we need, what we need to have for dealing with globalization is global mindset. And um, that's why I would wanted to look at that. And by the way, doesn't it look like us, like our committee? <laughs> Isn't that nice? <laughs> yeah, okay. I thought that's nice. So, 
Why didn't it? So, my purpose of the research is to determine the impact of nationality because we are, we are all a little bit different. And um, I wanted to know, because the previous research was only done when they put everybody together, they never compared two na nations or two uh, countries with each other in their global mindset. And that's why I wanted to do that, the impact of nationality on uh, the development of global mindset. And of course, to identify and refine the antecedents, the personal, educational, and professional background factors of global mindset. And um, if these background factors have something to do with the global mindset. And that's our model. That's our statistic model I will to talk about uh, later. So this is um, my passports, my two. So the um, German and the US. The research questions were, does the nationality of business leaders impact their global mindset? Does nationality affect the leader's personal, educational, and professional backgrounds? And do these personal, educational, professional factors contribute to the development of global <coughs> mindset? And which factors are most important? I looked at 20 factors, and I want to know which are the most important factors. And then is to what extent is the impact of nationality on the development of global mindset affected by these factors? And this is the model. I don't know why this is. So we have here, we have first nationality. That's the first hypothesis. So nationality goes to global mindset. So what I looked at is first, if there's a difference in global mindset between the nationalities. Then the next one, I looked at um, the background factors. If the background factors have is nationality, if, the, if these nationality, the Germans and the US citizens first, if they have different, um, if their background is different. And then I, we put everything together, all nationalities, the whole sample together, and looked which factors have an impact on global mindset. And then we did some statistics afterwards. So we put our arms around that and looked at what happens if we put everything together. I will talk about that a little bit later. Just a little bit overview in the, um, in the literature. It started all with a seminal work of, um, in 1969. This is always cited, but actually he's citing himself for 65, but it was published in <coughs> French, and I think that's why it's not widely known. So it starts the, with this model is with the home country oriented, the ethnocentric first. So we think, okay, we are the best and we know everything best and we don't need every, anybody else. That was the first thing. The next step was the polycentric, the host country oriented. Oh, there's somebody else that's nice and we can make money in another country. And if we make money with it and we get money out of it, that's fine, but we don't really know what they're doing. But as long as we get money, it's fine. And now we're here, we are geocentric. It's world-oriented. So we work all together, and we try to make the best of it. And the research now is going more on the third step. What do we need to work all together, and what is important to have? So they look at the social relationships. They, there's a lot going on now in the third part of this, this model. The data collection, it was... First, I, back tr I translated the survey into German to make sure that I also reached Germans um, who are not so familiar with the English language. Maybe everybody has to speak English because you have to learn it in, in school, but you know, if maybe from yourself, you learn the language and it fades away if you don't use it. And that's why I translated it. Then it was back translated by a Ger uh, an American who learned German, but his native uh, language is English. And then the committee reviewed it and said, OK, we have the, back, the original translation, the original version, and the back translation. And they looked at it. Maybe we have to adjust it. And uh, we made minor adjustments. So I sent out 1,112 sur <laughs> surveys, so it was a lot. And uh, of the, um, we had 98 had a US business address, and 21% responded. I think that's not bad. 
and um, the German business leaders, almost 55% responded. So the overall response rate was 25%. I think that's pretty good. I was really happy and I got some really good responses from them. So it was really rewarding. It was not bad, it was a really rewarding um, experience. The sample, we ended up, we excluded 12 leaders because they didn't have either the German or the US nationality. And so we ended up with 268. What we did, just a little bit for the methodology, we also included thematic analysis, but that's another story I don't want to talk today because it's, it's too much. <laughs> Sorry for that. But uh, we did the reliability and validity, we did the confirmatory factor analysis, Cron bus alpha, goodness of fit test, we did all of that. Frequency distribution, distribution linear regression, and we did ANOVA, linear multiple regression, and bootstrapping. So the whole package. So thank you, Matt. <laughs> Again, <laughs> what happened? The first hypothesis was the nationality of business leaders has an impact on their global mindset. And that was important, first of all, because we had 30 dual citizens in it, and I was thinking, okay, where should we put them? Do we put them? We had 12 German US, and we had 18 US and another citizenship. And then I said, okay, the, with the 12, uh, the, the 18, we put them to the US. And what happened? And what do we do with the rest? And what happened? They messed up the data. So first, my idea was to do um, US and German. And then I realized they messed up the data because they are totally different. So we made up a third group with dual citizens. <laughs> That's why we ended up. So then we changed the title. That, that happened. And you can see it here. These are all the, um, what we tested. The meta cognitive, the cognitive, the mod, um, motivation, and the, um, this is the global business acumen, and that's how we came up with global mindset. That's, these are the, total, the constructs we had. But we can see the light blue at the right end. This is the global mindset. And you can see the dual citizens are higher everywhere. Yeah, two minutes, okay. Sorry, okay. So the nationality of business leader has an impact on their personal background factors. Um, these are what we find out, found out is um, that the Germans don't differ so much, but uh, the dual citizens differ more. Then almost all our background factors were significant, so they are all important. The only one is the, uh, when you start a foreign language was not significant. The most important ones are these six. Personal foreign family member immersing in a foreign culture, international self-studying, amount of experience working abroad and working for foreigners domestically. And, what was, and this is our mediation model. So we have, when you put all the stuff together, your nationality and your background factors, suddenly nationality doesn't matter anymore. It just fades away. So first we had the difference in the nationality and now if we have all these background factors, it's irrelevant. And I think that's a really important finding. So first finding was the dual citizens are higher and the second one, nationality doesn't matter anymore. Limitations, of course, there because it was a survey and uh, you never know how uh, Germans react to the US. Future research, we can do a little bit more. And what we do now, we prepare all together a seminal paper about this. Summary and key contributions. Um, there was nothing out there. There's nothing out there about dual citizens. And of course, we uh, contribute a little bit more to the understanding of the educational, professional, and personal factors of global mindset. Um, it's actually been two years. Uh, and two of my three, uh, time, flies. I, time, fly, time flies, and two of my three uh, committee members are here. Dr. Stavros was my chair and Dr. Cole was my very patient uh, quantitative advisor. Um, I did a mixed method also. Um, I studied, uh, I had the opportunity, a great opportunity, and mostly it was, it was uh, by virtue of Jackie's connections, to take a, a 
a subject that I, I kind of didn't know that much about, um, but was very interested in, and that was you know Catholic institutions and kind of where. Uh, what the future held for them, and uh, as a lifelong practicing Catholic and someone educated in the Catholic schools, um, I, you know, I, I keep a current on topics related to uh, institutional development, and I, my area of my, uh, most of the area of my study was in cultural uh, studies and organization, cultural and identity, and I was given a great opportunity to work with a hospital in Florida to to study a problem that they're having. It's kind of an interesting problem. Um, and, and that was the primary research question of my study, and that is, how can Catholic healthcare institutions sustain uh, their culture in light of the fact that their cultural catalysts, the Catholic nuns, their founders, are dying? So I was able to work with Holy Cross Hospital in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I, they, they had were addressing their problem of their cultural uh, um, identity being dissipated by creating uh, an intervention called the Legacy Program. And this Legacy Program was directed, an educational Legacy Program was directed at their employees. And what they were trying to do was to see if they could enculturate their employees with the, uh, the essence of Catholic identity so that they would be able to take the culture, the caring and compassionate culture that was the foundation for Catholic healthcare into the next generation as the, the nuns were dying. And uh, to uh, provide a little bit of background, um, Catholic institutions in the United States were created by the Catholic nuns. They, uh, in particularly in the areas of education and healthcare and social service, uh, social services area. And the nuns came to the United States at the turn of the century and actually some as far back as the Revolutionary War, and they created institutions because they were trying to bring the Catholic culture into the United States, and they were trying to enculturate all of the uh, immigrants that were coming to the United States. So they were considered to be, in the literature, highly effective, the term is cultural catalysts. They were the, the uh, infusers of culture. Uh, they started the healthcare system in the United States and to show you how effective they were, and essentially with nothing but a letter from a bishop when they went into a city in the United States, and to show you how effective they were, uh, by 2009, one in every six admissions to a hospital in the U.S. was to a Catholic hospital. And they're nonprofit, and they were started uh, by the nuns. Well, what's the, the problem that they're facing? Well, the problem is that the nuns are dying. When I was in Catholic uh, elementary school in the 60s, there were about 185,000 nuns. Today, more, the more current numbers are about 48,000 in the U.S. They're actually growing in Asia and in Europe, but in the U.S., really, that, that's, a, a, that's an element of Catholic culture, that, the, the religious education area that's really um, dying out. So a couple of key concepts that my study... My study was really about organizational culture and identity, and in particular, Catholic culture and identity. And the essence, or the, the, the key concept that I was studying was identity as the essence of culture, as the core of culture. The problem, as we just talked about, is Catholic institutions losing their distinctive, enduring, and central essence. And in order to inherit a culture forward, you have to have an essence or an, an identity. And identity is very unstable and, very influ and can be very influenced. Um, Again, uh, the problem in particular with these institutions was the homogenization or secu secularization of the institutions. And that's because the nuns are dying and the employees in these institutions, educational and hospitals, are not enculturated with the Catholic, Catholic identities and ideas that will allow them to sustain that culture going forward. A couple of the key contributions to this study from my study were, first thing uh, was, and this was really something that Matt helped me with, I, I wasn't able to find a survey, and I really didn't want to make a survey because it seemed like a lot of work, but I couldn't find one. So um, he helped me to figure out how to create this, one of these little survey monkey things, and it was kind of fun. I, I had the same attitude as the, the previous presenter. I didn't want to get into all that grimble, but it really was a, a very interesting part of my research. Um, and we took that survey forward and we went through the, the quantitative uh, uh, rigor in order to make sure that it was reliable and, and valid. Um, I also was able to um, make sure that the, the intervention itself was, uh, was uh, productive and that it was uh, 
I was able to show that, that uh, culture was being retained. The, what you have to know about this legacy program was that the hospital ran it in cohorts, so I was actually able to take a graduate cohort against a cur current cohort against a base cohort, and I was able to compare the, the results, so I was able to show that their intervention uh, was actually working. Um, this was a very simple model that I worked on and actually blew it out into a number of different models, but I was able to show that their intervention, which was their, ac their academic program, the legacy program, was able to influence the beliefs and values of the participants and it was affecting their behavior, and which was reinforcing their beliefs. I used a mixed method study as well, a uh, mixed method study design as well. Um, I built my survey. I also built uh, something that I called the, the uh, Thoughtful Conversation, which was a, an interview guide. And I had a, a, this was probably the best part of my entire experience doing my dissertation work because I was able to work with this great group of people in the hospital and they just literally threw their doors open to me. It was amazing. Um, I did a pilot over the phone with them just to test out my uh, survey and my interview. And then I went on site uh, at the hospital and they set me up in a conference room and they helped to get all the people that were in the program to come and talk to me and it was just a fantastic experience. And I actually was able to come up with about 400 pages of interview information that then I could use and, and funnel into my uh, qual qualitative um, an analysis. I used, uh, uh, on the quantitative side, I used descriptive and oops sorry descriptive and in, in inferential statistics and on the qualitative side I created a hybrid the, um, thematic analysis mechanism uh, quantitatively I have to admit I really didn't want to do a mixed method <laughs> Jackie talked me into it <laughs> and that was great because it really showed that there was there was a room for that in, in my work. I wanted to really get down to the, the qualitative information that I was pulling out of my study and kind of see what the results were. But I think having a, a reliable and valid survey I really felt was a major contribution, especially since there wasn't one in the field. Um, so that's what the, the result of that analysis was. And I was also obviously able to, I used factor analysis and, and uh, CFA and EFA, and I was able to show uh, efficacy, efficacy of the program of the intervention as well. Um, qualitatively, I, I was quite proud of this work because I was able to take Richard Boyatz's um, thematic analysis work and to extend it uh, and make it more of a hybrid model. And uh, using uh, my interview and survey responses, um, I was able to create a, a kind of a fancy framework and then I built a few models and I was able to use the, uh, the themes that I drew out of my research to, uh, to build these models and to test the framework. And uh, I just like this chart, so I put it in here. <laughs> uh, this actually explained uh, deductive and inductive reasoning to me um, uh, and, and how thematic analysis could use both of these. And essentially, I, uh, and I got some great advice from a person that I met along the way. That was another wonderful experience that I had is I just met all these great people because I've been an IT director, I'm a vice president now, fancy title, but we're not as touchy-feely as academic people are. And what I fen found to be an amazing experience was that I would literally call people you know, out of the blue or Jackie would give me somebody's email address and these people, these Harvard people would talk to me about this great research they were doing. And one of the people that I talked to, Melanie Moray, who is a preeminent uh, educator at Harvard University, I think she's a provost at some small Catholic college now, but she was at Harvard for a long time. And she's an educator and uh, an author in uh, cultural retention in, in Catholic higher education. And she said to me, Maureen, you have to have a hunch. You have to write down that hunch and you have to go out there and try to test that hunch. And what I, and I, that, those words were sort of ringing in my ears when I was doing the qualitative research. And my hunch was to write, and, and Jackie said the same thing, write a predictive statement and see what happens. Take your, your data and see if it supports the predictive statement. So that's the, the hypothesis that I created. I built some themes, a priori themes, then I looked at my data and I said, are they supported? And then as you're looking at your data, you're building these other themes. It was just a, really a, a quite an interesting way of looking at data, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, implications of my study, the survey I thought was, uh, was a good result, um, an operational definition of Catholic identity, 
But what, what I thought was very interesting was that I was able to tell the hospital that their program was working, at least initially. And that's really, they, they were so generous with their time and their people. And all they really wanted from me was to say, do you think it's working? You know, we're not going to hold you to it, but do you think it's working? And I was able to look at their three cohorts and say, you know, quantitative and qualitatively, you, you are building identity through the content of your course, Catholic identity, in your first, your graduates are showing it. Your active people are certainly showing it, and your baseline is, are, are your baseline. What I was able to also show them was that their first, first cohort was starting to degrade a little bit, so they needed to put a, bo a booster back in place. And I, I, what I also, f I personally found interesting about the work was seeing what theory was in the field already and then taking a look at your data and seeing whether it supported it. So in the area of identity, Hatch and Schultz are, are the experts, Albert and Wetton in um, intervention efficacy, and Murray and Pitteray, Dr. Murray is the one of my informants. And I was able to show that their work, my data was supporting their work, and I thought that was also a pretty exciting outcome. An amazing title, isn't it? <laughs> great. Um, I have to mention first that I'm, I'm really honored to be a part of this first inaugural program here at LTU. I am a product of LTU. I am theory and practice. And I'm a triple alum from here. So uh, it's a great honor to be able to come back and to continue and be a part of this program. So let me get to this because Matt's going to be over there with those raised fingers in a second now. Uh, the importance of the study was that the, uh, the state of CSR uh, over the last 60 years has been very confused. It worked fine for regional and local businesses trying to define what it was that they did in the form of practicing social responsibility. But the big issue came in the last decade and a half where global business organizations found that global leadership gave uh, huge <laughs> issues. There were huge issues that companies had to face with what the definition of corporate social responsibility was from a global standpoint. So, in reviewing the literature over this over the last uh, 60 or 70 years, you come up with uh, uh, some summaries by Davis and Botow in 1972 and in the 60s. Uh, that CSR means different things to different people. And when you expand this to a global reach, it becomes radically different. For example, if Coca-Cola builds a new bottling plant somewhere in the United States, then the concept of corporate social responsibility that they practice is different than if they build that plant in, uh, say, India, to where corporate social responsibility at that point is extended to asking Coca-Cola to provide fresh and clean water because that's the primary source of the tool that they use to make their product. The literature lacked sufficient studies to compare one aspect of, of corporate social responsibility, and that's local community development. That's the one that matters to all of us. Where we live, what does that company down the street do to help improve our community, besides just giving us great jobs, good income, uh, and some future. So what that really meant was is that businesses were left to their own devices in order to decide, they had to make assumptions about what they did for the local community as to whether or not it was actually something the local community wanted or desired or needed. So the potential of this study then was to inform and redefine the donation process because I looked at only one small aspect of this and this is the the uh, philanthropical component of corporate social responsibility. There are multiple others. Uh, Waddock, as late as uh, 2004, when you consider that this has been written about for over 80 years, found that there were nine different categories for social responsibility and 25 subcategories used to describe it. So the point was, was to try to find some clarity through all of this, through this study. Uh, this is one of the first studies that was based on the new ISO 26000 CSR behavior guidelines. These were just published in 2011. Now what's critically important about this is that this was the result of a six year longitudinal effort by over 99 countries and 465 global experts in the concept of 
corporate social responsibility so that they could come up with universal definitions so that businesses could be held to a metric that now they could compare from one nation to the next. So this was the foundation that I used for this study. The design was an iterative design, uh, mixed methods. It used an anonymous survey and confidential interviews to understand business philanthropic decisions. The instrumentation that was used were two pieces. The survey was based on the universal definitions for local community development, philanthropic activity. Um, so the categories were listed out for me. And this is where there were issues with research that was done earlier in this field, is that the definitions of what local community development was were not universal. They weren't accepted universal by other regions of the country or other locations. So by using this as the guideline, a survey was built. Uh, and then from the survey results, uh, we ended up with confidential interviews that explored business leader community activity. So let's get to these. Because our time is short, I thought it made more sense to work from the results and sort of work backwards. Uh, the survey itself uh, gave local community members. There were 500 surveys that were distributed. There was a return rate of about 52%, so that was fairly good. Um, and it asked people to rank these four definition areas, outright grants, money, staff volunteers helping with projects and expertise, in-kind donations, which were non-monetary, and then matching grants where it required community dollar support to match it. Now, these definitions are directly from ISO 26000. Um, and then it also asked donation distribution management, which was another part of the survey. And there were three choices here, a representative group of the community, the organization that gives the donation, or elected community leaders. That's kind of interesting. You can see the elected community leaders seem to be trusted least because they're the third choice of any of the survey participants. Uh, we have kind of a mixed bag here because in the results from the local community looking at donation choices, we have outright grants, which seem to be the majority, just give us money. But they also wanted that managed by a representative group of the community. And then staff volunteers, which sort of surprised me on this, is what people are really asking for is not so much money, but they really want corporations to come into their community and help them by providing training programs, opportunities for, for kids in school, a number of these kinds of uh, events. Uh, from this, there was also a line in the survey that asked the community members to please list any business that they knew of and give specific information on it that actively participated in donating to the community. So out of that, 40 different businesses were nominated by survey participants. Now, breaking that down, it turned out that by simple definition, there were 24 of the 40 that were corporations. And there were uh, 15 of, the, uh, uh, of that group, which were uh, categorized as small business. And we look at those that, every, all 40 were offered an uh, opportunity for an interview. All 24 of the corporations chose to defer the interview as opposed to reject it. Uh, five of the small businesses rejected and 11 accepted. So we had uh, 16 small businesses in the group. Now, this was a surprise in this study because all the corporations said, well, we don't want to tell you no, but we have to figure out who should answer these questions inside our organization. And I would get deferred to different levels of management, marketing groups, the public relations group, uh, a few uh, were HR groups, 
And I persisted in continuing to contact these people. And as of two weeks ago, all 24 still remain on the deferred list, which is kind of interesting. So the anomaly points to a shift in CSR strategy when small business owners become corporate entities, which I think was a very important finding on this. Then looking at the sample pool in the survey, you know, how uniform was this? And it turns out that there were no statistical differences in distribution for gender, housing, or race between the sample, the county, which was Macomb County, or the state of Michigan. What emerged from this uh, in doing the interviews with this group was six salient themes. Now, these business owners, many of them were just startups, and these are people that are folks in your neighborhood. They could be the donut shop, they could be the repair shop down the corner. Uh, some of them were larger organizations that were involved in this, but the business owner, entrepreneur, was the primary contact person for this uh, activity. And what came out of this was, uh, using grounded theory, was these six themes. Engaging in supporting the local community. Their workers found they had more meaningful work, the ones that worked for these companies. They also experienced a situation where customers became partners. Uh, there was a situation where there was a, a late night uh, accident where a drunk driver went through the front window of this small business. And he lives about 30 miles away. And by the time the police had arrived, there was a team of customers who were partners who lived right in the neighborhood. And what they did was they took a watch on, the, on this man's business until the police could get there. And they asked why they did that, and they said, because we see him as a partner with our community, which was a really cool finding. Uh, causes unite people. A lot of times a small business, this is uh, anybody that's got uh, uh, kids uh, or is involved with the PTA or the PTC, you know, you're engaged in these kinds of activities and you're always going to the local business to support, hey, can you donate this or donate that? Uh, what a lot of these businesses found is that in doing that, in participating, it actually united the neighborhood uh, to be more of support for them. It's also relationship building, and they found business success through community support. Now, one of the interesting things about that was that some of these business owners had mentioned that they are now seen as super business leaders by their peers who don't do this. So now they're actually being asked to come and talk to other businesses to tell them how to get engaged with the local community. And then value creation. So the experiences of business owners in the study confirm that continuous collaboration ensures mutual success. Now, I've taught for 23 years, and I hate this death by PowerPoint, but because we're of short time, <laughs> there's a couple of points I have to make here. And this relates back to the concept of uh, those 24 corporations that chose to defer uh, being a part of this but didn't want to say no. Uh, organizations no longer have the luxury of a no-comment response when it comes to local community support. And the organization that distances itself from the community can expect the community to do the same. I think we've seen recently Walmart's taken some huge hits in different parts of the country. And part of that is its less defined community support with some of the hardline situations they've taken. We are global, and Tom Marks, our global expert here, uh, in leadership, this is all linked together. And that's the beauty of doing research. It is all linked together. It's all of us learning from these kinds of things and just seeing the kinds of stuff that goes on in our neighborhoods uh, that make us better in the long run. So some final thoughts. <laughs> I've heard some comments about research here this morning. Well, research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. And then, of course, if we knew what it was we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? So the work continues. There's much more to do on this. It was kind of a landmark study. I'm looking at some publication opportunities for this. 
And of course, there's more advanced work to go in and try to answer some of these questions that came out of this study. So thank you for this morning. I'm really pleased to be here today and um, I, to present this uh, new idea, new concept that comes directly from my work that uh, on behalf of the Center for Nonprofit Management and teaching as a senior lecturer in our graduate nonprofit management program. Um, this uh, concept has been derived uh, by my, uh, partly by my participation at the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, their health safety net planning committee for three years now. This statewide committee has been focusing on what's referred to as the health safety net organizations. These are a series of nonprofit organizations that provide primary and preventive care to low income uninsured throughout the country. Um, one of these major providers, these nonprofit organizations, is called the Federally Qualified Healthcare Center. And this has been a major focus of the symposiums that we've been offering annually, the statewide symposiums on behalf of the Blues, called the Healthy Safety Net Symposiums. And my contribution to this wonderful group is to provide insight regarding the management of charitable organizations and what that can do to help them move through what is dramatic change that's happening in the healthcare sector today, and in particular, for the variety of nonprofit organizations that are the healthcare providers. Most people don't realize that approximately 60% of the healthcare providers in the United States are 501c3 charities. So not only are they being impacted by uh, the huge uh, healthcare reform uh, measures and laws and regulations that require them to change their clinical practices and the way they practice and measure outcome, health outcomes, but also they need to pay attention to how the organization can adapt this change. And that's where uh, I have found that uh, my contribution has been most helpful because much of this uh, has been well studied actually in the, in the uh, over the years and this is what we teach in our graduate nonprofit program. So again what we've focused on is the federally qualified health care center. To make it clear this organization is uh, legislatively required. FQHC is a nonprofit health clinic providing health care, uh, primary health care, preventive care with a special federal designation. They're located only in the poorest and rural uh, of rural and urban neighborhoods in our country. FQHCs provide health care services to all, regardless of income and ability to pay. There are over 1,100 federally qualified health centers throughout the country, and there are 30 in Michigan. The FQHC uh, status authorizes them for, to be a Medicare provi Medicaid provider and receive special uh, funding. The FQHC is in the midst of transformation, in the midst of the healthcare reform transformation throughout our communities. They are um, the major healthcare provider in low and poor income neighborhoods throughout our country. They are de dealing with uh, meaningful use of electronic medical records, this whole new trend to implement EHR throughout the healthcare system, and to digitize all healthcare information that will, is, is aimed at measuring health outcomes um, by using this data. They are on the front lines of what, you, what you've been hearing about in terms of the expansion of Medicaid. And this is uh, another part of the ACA which calls for uh, Medicaid to be expanded to a larger population. That is 138% of the poverty level and to all different types of persons, not just families and children. This has resulted in a dramatic increase in their target market of low-income patients with insurance. And may, may, please make it clear, it's their target market. 
they are interested in serving. That's their mission. So they are keenly interested in capturing that market and providing services to this once it is approved. And by the way, that's being debated as we speak in Michigan. There's also increased competition from other providers for this new market of low-income patients who have insurance. Hospitals are actively changing their marketing strategies and trying to align themselves to anticipate this new large market of insured low-income people for their, uh, to fill their uh, health care services and programs. So the focus of my attention has come to the fact that these FQHCs are in the midst of tremendous transformation. There's a lot on the line here. But my work on the committee for three years now has shown me that they are really struggling. That at fundamental levels, they are dealing uh, with uh, dramatic change that they're not being able to move through as an organization. And this obviously brings to light all the work, all the teaching I've been doing in a graduate nonprofit management program regarding nonprofit organizational best practices and what is commonly and well researched body of information there. So, the, but the FQHC is in this unique situation where they're a 501c3 charity, and like other nonprofits, they have a governing board which is made up of volunteers in the community. However, unlike other nonprofits who are free to select any board member, they are legislatively required by federal law to have 51% of the members who are active registered clients of the health center. And they represent the population of the community they served. Thus, when you look at a board of an FQHC, it's made up of 51% of the clients of that community that, that get health care services. So that means since these organizations are located in the poorest of neighborhoods, rural and urban, by the way, that we have this, uh, on one hand, a very wonderful opportunity for an organization to be directly impacted and make decisions by the customers of that community. But at the same time, it seems we may have an issue regarding that organization, that board's being able to move through change and make the decisions they need to address the dramatic change that will benefit themselves and their own clients and communities. The legislative intent, obviously, this goes way back uh, in the federal law. The FQHC was, was set up to serve the community and be served by the community and be directed by the community. So that, they're, they're very proud of this. It's a very important feature of the FQHC that uh, needs to be honored and maintained, but we also need to help them move through change. There's a large body, body of research that we teach in our graduate programs uh, regarding best practices of effective leadership by nonprofit boards. It, uh, our latest, uh, what we're teaching is that, in fact, there's so many different researchers that have uh, produced different strategies, but they can be summarized by these eight core functions. Nonprofit boards need to lead the organization, establish policy, secure essential resources, ensure effective resource use, lead and manage chief executive performance, engage with constituents, ensure accountability, and ensure board effectiveness. This best summarizes what the most effective charitable organizations today, what their board looks like, how it behaves. And this is very well documented. In fact, there's now normed assessment tools that are being developed that, um, who you, what, that can be used to measure and indicate whether your a particular organization is operating at its best level. So this leads to my research questions that uh, all this current work and my current teaching, I would like to begin to study here. Um, one is how applicable is the research in best practices of nonprofit boards to this unique board of a federally, acquired, a federally uh, qualified health center? 
does the unique board composition requirement that 51% of the community and clients uh, serve on a board impact its ability to implement organizational change and how it impacts that? And finally, is there specialized training or support that is needed and that can be provided to this unique organization at a key time in our, uh, in our US history and healthcare transformation that would help it move through this change and successfully orient itself to its new market? Methodology. Um, I would like to, I will continue my work in partnership with the statewide association. Um, I'm in the midst of a literature review with, there's a lot written on the 51% federally qualified healthcare requirement, board requirement, but there's not a lot of work on the impact of it regarding the organizational effectiveness. Um, I would like to identify and apply some assessment tools that are out there that I've looked at for other nonprofit organizations and sam use them to sample FQHC organizations. And finally, to develop and apply a new survey with questions designed to understand how FQHC boards assess their effectiveness and leadership roles and it's the impact of the 51% community member, member requirement. With this, I would like, to, I would hope to be able to provide current information that's helpful to the FQHC community and to help them move through the transformational times that they're facing uh, today in the U.S. health care system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say a couple of words to kind of introduce the subject. Um, so I'm an attorney and so is my colleague Atul Trivedi. I teach here at Lawrence Tech and although my background is primarily in litigation, I became a lot more interested in intellectual property issues through teaching at Lawrence Tech, through administering to business students and dealing with the questions and concerns that they have and the topics that they're interested in. So. Um, my colleague Atul Trivedi is actually a patent attorney with over 10 years of experience and he's recently joined the Detroit branch of the United States Patent and Trademark Office as a patent examiner. So we kind of bring our respective backgrounds to this research and although it's legal and it's meant for publication in a law journal, um, we've kind of prepared it to give you a little bit of background so that um, you can all kind of see the relevance and the implications for the business community. Okay, so we're going to be covering a couple of different areas here, and they all have to deal with some recent changes that have taken place that are extremely relevant for the business community, the legal community, and the public at large. So um, the Leahy Smith America Invents Act was signed into law in 2011, and it represents a major overhaul of the United States patent system. Now, in the summer of 2012, we saw the filing of Madstad versus United States, where plaintiff Madstad Engineering and Mark Stadnick have challenged the constitutionality of the America Invents Act. Um, they have alleged that the act is unconstitutional because it violates the purpose, scope, history, um, and intent of uh, the intellectual property clause of the Constitution and have further alleged that the change from first to invent to first to file, which we're going to explain, will adversely affect small businesses. Um, in addition, we'll be talking, we'll be addressing um, a couple of the issues in Madstad's argument, as well as the constitutional intent behind the intellectual property clause, and also be talking about some recent research that has just come out this month about the effects in Canada of the first, of the transition to the first to file system, and how it's affected small businesses and the granting of patents um, in general. So what we're going to do is first give you a very brief overview of the relevant features of the U.S. patent system, discuss the changes of the America Invents Act, describe the details of the challenge in Madstad versus United States, and then after we have that background, we will get into the historical evolution of patent law in the United States and the framers' constitutional intent in providing um, providing uh, the power, the congressional power to grant IP uh, rights and authority. 
and then we'll discuss the uh, research from Canada about the effects of the first to file system and then overview some of the implications that we feel that it raises for the public. And now I'll turn it over to Atul. Thank you, Padmini, and thank you all for giving me a chance to speak with you this morning. Basically, ever since the days of the Founding Fathers, the patent system in the United States has granted a limited monopoly on inventions to the first person who can demonstrate that they invented the given uh, invention or technology at issue. This means that even though someone else files an application with the patent office on this given invention, if I, for example, can come into the patent office and show lab notebooks or records or something else like that that demonstrate that I came up with this invention before the person who filed that patent application, I still get the patent right because I came up with it first. And until September of 2011, the patent system had always rewarded the initial innovator, the first inventor, with that, pat with that patent right. The Leahy Smith America Invents Act abrogates that system in an attempt basically to harmonize the American patent system with patent systems elsewhere in the world, everywhere else, for example, Japan, Europe, anywhere you can name, and Canada as of uh, 1989, for example, that instead the first person to file a patent application now gets the priority under the act. And so that's um, the main uh, issue that uh, Mark Stadnick and his company, Madstad Engineering, bring up with this lawsuit. Now, under the previous system, you have three requirements in order to get a patent in the first place. The invention has to be novel, of course, new. It cannot be simply an obvious or cosmetic modification of something already there. And utility basically means that it cannot be simply an algorithm or a manipulation of numbers or an equation or something like that. Um, not based on prior art, not simply a reproduction of what had been happening before. 20 year duration of the patent from the date of filing for a utility patent and 14 years for design patents which focus on aesthetic features of the invention. Um, the first inventor gets priority. And in determining who's the first inventor, the patent office conducts what are called interference proceedings, where uh, a prior inventor can come in against one who actually filed the application and present evidence to demonstrate, hey, I came up with this first. I invented this, not you. And therefore, I get the patent. The grace period protects inventors against public disclosures of the invention immediately prior to filing. That means basically that if someone presents the invention for sale at a given point, say today, like if I displayed my invention here, this gizmo here, that means that from today's date, and uh, I mean before the act was invented, uh, or passed, excuse me, from that point that I present the invention in public, I have one year in which to file my patent application with the US Patent Office, or else I abandon or lose my right to file on the invention. These uh, priority proceedings, or interferences, as the patent system refers to them by statute, um, generally, <clears throat> let's see. Actually, under um, the, uh, the changes to the Act and uh, as a follow-up to some of the changes that took place in Canada, uh, different research studies have looked at what has happened in the wake of the change in Canada to the uh, new system. And as a general matter, those who, um, those who come in claiming prior inventorship usually end up defeating the first person to file the patent application in about 40% of the cases where a challenge to the first filer is filed with uh, the intellectual property office. So that gives you a, a, a preview of the success rates in these interference proceedings. Now, in some of the debates that led to the eventual passing of this act, uh, different uh, congressmen and senators, especially 
uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein from California, uh, spoke out quite strongly against this change from first to invent over to the first to file system that the U.S. has now. And some of the uh, arguments that she brought up include the fact that this creates races to the patent office. People rush to file whatever they have at the moment rather than taking the time to develop everything and have it um, fully uh, researched beforehand. Um, proponents of the act have criticized the interference procedure as um, not resolving anything, but um, interference proceedings conducted before the office, as you can see, 50 interferences out of a, an average number of almost half a million patent applications filed, a very small percentage. So that does not burden the system very much. And derivation, the uh, derivation of the in invention from the original inventor is much tougher to prove under the new system. So I turn it back to Padmini for a moment. Okay, um, so since I guess we're running short on time already, um, just a brief word about the international system and some of the reasons for the changes. Um, essentially, our international trade agreements governed by the WTO and recent changes such as TRIPS have largely affected the implementation of the America Invents Act. Under the World Trade Organization's GATT and GATS, which are the General Agreement on um, Tariffs and Trade and the General Agreement on uh, Trade and Services, these impose negative rules on countries, such as they may not make um, safety or health regulations that burden trade unfairly. But TRIPS, which is trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights and our current international intellectual property rights agreement, under that, to which all WTO countries are signatories, um, countries are required to enforce positive legislation that protects intellectual property rights and provides procedures for filing um, enforcement mechanisms and punishment and damages. So in light of that, the fact that TRIPS, which other countries have to adopt, is largely based on U.S. law, but U.S. law is first to invent, while all other countries tend to be first to file, has also provided some of the impetus to change the U.S. over into a system that coordinates more strongly with other countries. Under the Act, uh, a number of changes come into the U.S. patent system. Basically, the first inventor uh, to file with the office now gets priority on the patent application. The grace period of one year after public disclosure is eliminated per the new statute. Reduced fees come in for small entities and small businesses, which uh, Mr. Grigorich talked about in his presentation, so that's a, a benefit under the statute. And uh, prior art citations against the application, previous patents that could show that this thing is not new anymore, uh, the rules on those will slightly change under the new act as well. This lawsuit challenging the act was filed by a gentleman by the name of Mark Stadnick. He's an inventor in Florida. He's invented, among other things, a number of like windshields that can be attached to motorcycles and uh, protect the riders from environmental effects, uh, things like that. He challenged the act, stating that it violates the constitutional provision that gives rise to the patent system in the first place. The U.S. is one of the only countries in the world that actually mentions the term inventors within its constitution. And the basic spirit of the lawsuit alleges that this change to first to file abrogates the rights of inventors and therefore is unconstitutional for that reason. Also that it uh, will hurt small businesses in the long run because larger corporations have more wherewithal to file applications and will therefore uh, have a greater patent rights as a result. So the procedural steps that have happened in the lawsuit, motions to dismiss by the U.S. Patent Office and the federal government, uh, this is to be continued. So we'll see what happens as it goes forward. Um, Comments on the lawsuit, a, a number of uh, law professors have dismissed the lawsuit as being almost quixotic and criticized Stadnick for chasing after windmills in his pursuit of this. The community has been generally dismissive in its analysis of this lawsuit and the arguments that Stadnick and Madstad try to make. And other bloggers, uh, especially by um, Professor Crouch, uh, one of the leading uh, patent bloggers and patent attorneys in the community, 
uh, cite uh, the Golan case, a copyright case that was decided in the Supreme Court last year, where there the U.S. harmonized its copyright practices in line with other countries as regarding uh, pieces of classical music and the removal of those pieces of music from the public domain such that they're protected again. And uh, I turn this back to Padmini for the next section. All right, we're just going to wrap this up really quickly. But basically, um, Mark Stadnick alleges in his complaint that the changes to from first to invent to first to file violate our Constitution. So we take a brief look at constitutional intent. So ultimately, I've noticed this from my students, but um, and in general, people are discussing IP rights, but we tend to think of intellectual property as a traditional type of property that accords the same kinds of rights as other types of property. But in fact, intellectual property really evolved as a type of monopoly, not an actual right. Traditionally, our English precedent shows that it's a privilege. The royal crown in England used to grant limited monopolies to certain merchants and artisans, also just friends of the crown, to kind of um, reward their patronage. So patents began as simply a type of monopoly. And there was a great deal of evidence that our founding fathers, such as James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, um, Supreme Court Justice John Marshall, and other framers actually considered patents to be monopolies, not rights. Um, so the statute of monopolies of 1623 is our first statutory precedent from England that's a basis for dealing with these types of limited monopolies. And if you look at the language of this, it does somewhat reflect some of the language of, um, of the time of constitutional drafting, which is that monopolies in general are bad, but in some cases we can create an exception for monopolies that are based on people's ingenuity or invention. Um, this is our intellectual property clause, and I just want to draw your attention to the fact that it begins with the idea that to promote the progress of science and useful arts, we secure for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their discoveries. Um, in letters from Jefferson and Madison and other framers, it is pretty clear that as far as the founding fathers were concerned, they didn't think that in inventors had any inherent monopoly right to their inventions. What they thought was monopolies were inherently bad, but because giving a limited monopoly might encourage inventions and therefore benefit the public, we might want to allow them. But Jefferson actually wanted the intellectual property clause amended out of the Constitution. And Madison's response was largely that because we're a government of the people, because we're a democracy, we don't have to worry about monopolies badly affecting our economy. Okay, and so basically we think constitutional intent does not actually support uh, the granting of patents. And the evidence from Canada shows that it has a negative effect on small businesses. So the final question that we'd like to ask is whether or not the old patent system or the new patent system, whether any of these truly benefit the public as much as they could. And um, why don't you get, tell us the title of your talk? I'm going to talk to you today about supply chain management strategies in the U.S. motor vehicle industry. Um, I feel like I should belt out a show tune or something. Um, I'll give you a brief overview, and since I only have a few minutes, I'll cut some of that short. And I, too, like somebody else um, mentioned, had to do a mixed method study because of Jackie. Um, and I'll try to hit to the findings and discussion, uh, which is the most important. The purpose of this was to look at factors, basically market and technological factors, and how they affect total transaction costs in a supply chain management role. And then to determine if those transaction costs affect, affect the supplier management strategy, specifically in the U.S. automotive industry. And then I wanted to develop some kind of model to help practitioners develop this strategy. This was the model I came up with, and if you want to know how many revisions it went through, ask Dr. Marx, it was hundreds. Um, we look at factors, market factors, which include demand, potential suppliers, warranty failures and things, and then the techno technological factors, which intellectual property does play a uh, role in this, um, technological change and so forth. Total transaction costs consist of the actual transaction cost, managing your suppliers, um, switching your suppliers, and then risk. Business risk, investment, 
and an intellectual property risk, which leads to two strategies that we focused on, a arm's length or market-based strategy and a supply chain management strategy, which emphasized more of a partnership model. So my questions were basically that. Do the market factors affect the total transaction cost? Do the technological factors affect total transaction cost? And then how does that work in the supplier management strategy in the US automotive industry? These were my hypotheses, which mirror the model. And I followed the conceptual model. I also collected um, basic demographic data. And then I asked a final question to get any more information that could aid in this study in determining how these strategies were put in place. And the first result, I did have a statistical significance on the results of my hypothesis. Um, interesting things, stability of demand, which I thought was going to be a real important part of this and part of the research, didn't have a statistical significance, as did the level of competition. I thought those two things would drive the strategy selection. Looking at technological change, uniqueness of product, they were all significant except the uniqueness of product, which I figured, based on intellectual property, would have some kind of effect on how do I select my strategy and how does that affect my transaction cost. The interesting result of hypothesis three was that overall cost was not statistically significant. Yet when I ran these functions together, cost and risk were statistically significant. But cost essentially did not play the largest role in choosing a transaction or a supplier management strategy. When I ask primarily what type of strategy you use, it was usually a combination of a market or arm's length strategy and a partnership or supply chain management strategy. The two pure supply chain management strategies and pure arm's length strategies fell at the bottom. So primarily, we see we're using a combination of strategies to manage our supply base. Ranking the importance of factors or what your business chooses to look at in terms of what's important to my strategy, what am I going to get out of this, reducing risk, increasing your competitive advantage, uh, product quality, and reducing the cost of product, product um, cost of the product, and then long-term relationships. So we have seen over the years of this evolving and the changes that are important in managing your suppliers and putting that strategy in place to accomplish that. How am I doing so far? OK. My last question was to try to derive any other information that I hadn't asked about in the uh, quantitative survey. And the thing that popped up was government regulations. And Dr. Marks and I were running, running through the view, and we were both amazed that neither of us thought of government regulations as affecting strategy. We missed that in all the revisions. <laughs> so the results, market and technology factors affect the total transaction cost. As the factors increase, transaction costs increase. Total transaction cost affects the supplier management strategy. As the transaction costs increase, uh, the reliance on the supply chain management strategies increase as opposed to the arm's length or market. Um, I said that. The model I came up with was to look, look at transaction costs basically high, low, and then transaction risk, low and high. And from the model, we can see that when transaction costs are low, we use the combination strategy, and as we start to get low transaction costs and high risk, then we use a combination strategy to manage our supply base, reduce our costs, reduce our risk. 
Okay, so um, my research really revolves around uh, integrating two concepts within the field of entrepreneurship. So you've got social entrepreneurship, uh, which is uh, the pursuit of a social mission uh, by commercial means or by using market-driven strategies, and urban entrepreneurship, uh, which is a new evolving field in entrepreneurship, which involves uh, small business development and creation in low to moderate income urban communities, right? So we'll start with social entrepreneurship and social innovation. Uh, they really are growing areas of interest uh, within uh, the academia field, public, private, government, and in investment sectors. There are a lot of uh, investment uh, funds and venture capital funds that are launching just to fund social venture enterprises, but we don't have time to get into all of that, but uh, it's a really a growing field. Uh, this phenomenon of social venture enterprise creation uh, really has far-reaching implications for helping underserved communities uh, in urban environments across the country, right? And the goal of the research is really is to show that there is triple bottom line value that uh, social vendor enterprises can provide to inner city communities within urban America, okay? All right. So social entrepreneurship, what the heck is it, <laughs> right? I get this a lot from my students. I get this a lot from uh, others in the field. You know, is it a, is it a nonprofit? Is it a for-profit? Is it both? What is it? Well, here's what the literature says about defining social entrepreneurship. It's really a form of entrepreneurship that is motivated primarily by social benefit as opposed to economic benefit. Now, social entrepreneurship still generates a profit for the organization, but the primary goal is to promote a social cause or to uh, you know, correct a social issue, to have social impact, right? Social impact first, then economic impact second. Okay, and social entrepreneurship, as uh, Arthur Brooks says in his work, social entrepreneurship generally acts in a way that is congruent or agreeable with market sources and market forces, I should say. Okay, um, simply put, the bottom line, uh, I like this definition from recent literature uh, social entrepreneurship really is any pursuit of a social mission through commercial means, right? So a nonprofit can start a social venture. An individual entrepreneur can also start a social venture. But the uh, primary means to achieve that social mission is through commercial means, right? Market-based uh, business models. All right. So what is, who is a social entrepreneur? Well, Martin and Osberg uh, define in their seminal article in uh, the Stanford Social Innovation Review in 2007, they define a social entrepreneur as someone who targets an unfortunate but stable equilibrium, right, where supply and demand meet, but the supply and demand intersection is at a low area in the curve, right? But social entrepreneurs, they bring to bear a new equilibrium, right, that targets uh, a population of society that has been neglected, marginalized, et cetera, and they bring improvements to that group based on the venture, the for-profit venture that they start, that they launch, okay? So this is a model, uh, we academics love the two-by-two two matrix, right? So you've got, uh, in Martin and Osberg, they differentiate social entrepreneurship from other forms of social engagement, right? So you've got the nature of the action on Y axis, and you've got the outcome on the X axis, right? So social service providers, yeah, they provide direct action, but they provide direct action to maintain the current equilibrium, right? The current system. Whereas you've got social activists who they advocate for uh, a new equilibrium to improve society, but they're doing it in an indirect fashion, right? Whereas you've got social entrepreneurship that does both, right? Social entrepreneurs provide direct action to create a new equilibrium to improve society, okay, through their market, through market forces, all right? 
so social venture enterprises create something called social value. So this is the key distinction between what the authors call commercial entrepreneurship versus social entrepreneurship. Commercial entrepreneurship is primarily motivated by economic gain, whereas social entrepreneurship is driven by creating social value as opposed to economic value. And these social venture enterprises create social value in a number of ways. It's primarily directly through the business model. Does the business model directly impact the social issue or the social problem that the venture was launched to, uh, to address, right? And they do this either through direct employment of the disadvantaged members of society that the social venture enterprise is targeting with its mission, or by actually servicing those individuals as customers, right? So individuals who are you know, socioeconomically disadvantaged or they have some form of a barrier to society, the business directly targets uh, those individuals as target, in their target market, okay? So, but the authors say it's really hard to measure social value. That's really the challenge right now in the literature within social entrepreneurship. It's hard to measure, it's hard to quantify, right? And the authors really say that it's hard because it's hard when you have issues related to causality, multi-causality. How can the social entrepreneur really target his or her efforts from her firm to have the actual impact uh, in society if there is an improvement in the uh, social welfare social welfare can the social entrepreneur directly attribute his or her efforts towards that social improvement right so that's hard simply put the research question one of the research questions that i would like to uh pursue how can a social entrepreneur truly measure social value Right? Well, Brooks gives us two ways to measure social value. Right? He gives a qualitative perspective and a quantitative perspective. Uh, I won't go through each of the qualitative uh, m measurements here, but it basically mirrors that of a nonprofit. Right? So you have a for profit venture who's measuring itself using nonprofit evaluation methods. Right? From a quantitative perspective, uh, Brooks uses a concept called social return on investment, right? We all business scholars, we know what ROI is, but he introduces a concept called social ROI, right? Where you introduce this concept of blended value, right? Which combines economic value with social purpose value to create a measurement system called blended value, right? So social entrepreneurs need to have a blended value proposition, okay? That's just a uh, numeric way of uh, depicting blended value where you actually add social purpose value with economic value to arrive at blended value, okay? So sustainability, when we introduce sustainability with entrepreneurship, we move from this double bottom line or blended value proposition to a sustainable value proposition, right? So these are just uh, sustainability indicators from the uh, sustainability textbook that uh, in the MBA program, the sustainability course that uh, is used here. So the issue is how can we use these metrics to apply to uh, social value creation in inner city environments? Okay, so uh, this is from uh, Chris Laszlo's book, Sustainable Value. The whole idea is that social venture enterprises need to maximize not only shareholder value, but stakeholder value as well. Okay, so now we move into urban entrepreneurship, right? Not a lot in the literature on urban entrepreneurship as opposed to social entrepreneurship, but the few scholars that I was able to find out, uh, they define urban entrepreneurship as small businesses that operate in or they serve economically distressed areas, right? In underserved inner city communities. So small business development in these areas. Um, but because of the high population of minorities uh, in inner city communities, uh, some authors uh, tend to use urban entrepreneurship as a euphemism for minority entrepreneurship. 
So oh, there's my timer for 10 minutes. Um, but there's also a concept of micro enterprise development, right? Which is small business development in disadvantaged and low to moderate income communities, right? So I'll just skip through to my uh, conceptual model here where you got social entrepreneurship and urban entrepreneurship. Can you create a framework to help social entrepreneurs launch social venture enterprises in urban inner city communities? And I'll just end it there. So.